developments in Putin's war on Ukraine from retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis and former U.S. diplomat Craig Singleton. Uh, gentlemen, let me begin with you, Colonel. I, I think it goes without saying that when we look at the broad picture of what Vladimir Putin is attempting to do, he is gobbling up land. In fact, he's been doing this for some time. We can talk about Georgia and Crimea, not just Ukraine. Uh, and now he's sort of lashing out financially. I'm just wondering, Colonel, do you see this as a man who is desperate to hang on to power, or is this all part of a very successful campaign? Well, uh, in no way can anyone call this successful in any category. Uh, but this is uh, these uh, sanctions are, are entirely predictable because it's basically a, a, a tit for tat response, which Russia is famous for doing for the sanctions that we put on a lot of individuals in the, in the Russian government to include uh, their uh, foreign ministry spokeswoman, Zakharova. Uh, but the, the, without question, this is not going the way that, that Putin wanted to. He has uh, definitely slowed down. But we, I, I do caution that we don't want to celebrate too quickly because there are uh, indications that they're bringing in potentially up to 40,000 more irregulars, whether from the Wagner Group or even from Syrian refugees, uh, I'm sorry, from Syrian fighters in, in, that they have worked with in the past but to potentially start investing and fighting in Kiev and in so, uh, and some of the other cities in there. And uh, that would be bad news if that happens because that would just expand the destruction. But I think Biden is right to withhold the, any idea about no-fly zone, not to get us any more involved, but he's also right to continue helping them with uh, things that actually make a difference, like anti-armor capabilities. Yeah, I suspect Putin will also uh, reach again into the Chechen uh, war chest and try to get more fighters there, too. Let me ask you, Craig, um, I don't think this happens without strong support from China. Uh, people aren't talking a lot about that. I think it's beginning to sort of percolate to the top of conversation. I'm just curious from your perspective, how long does Beijing sort of play a quiet role in bankrolling Moscow and keeping them afloat, especially given the sanctions? Thanks for having me. Well, I think we've started to see a really, uh, a real evolution in China's approach to the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and increasingly recognition in Beijing that they are dangerously exposed to Western sanctions. And as a result, what I would expect over the next uh, few weeks is increasingly increasing calls from Beijing uh, for some sort of a ceasefire or uh, a mediated settlement. And at the same time, you're going to see increasing pressure here from the United States on China um, pretty much saying if you cross the line, if you skirt these sanctions, Chinese entities and Chinese financial institutions could find themselves subject to U.S. sanctions or secondary U.S. sanctions. And the Europeans are also starting to get into the game. And so I do think this is a point of leverage for the United States in its dealings both with Russia and with Beijing going forward. Yeah, excellent point there as we take a look at the sunrise over Kiev at this hour. Twelve minutes after the hour as we continue our coverage of the war with Craig Singleton and uh, Colonel Daniel Davis. Uh, let me share something from the Times. I think you'll find this interesting, Colonel, and I'd love to get your reaction to it. This is from uh, Stephen Lee Myers and Chris Buckley. At the heart of China's strategy lies a conviction that the United States is weakened from reckless foreign adventures, including from Beijing's perspective, goading Mr. Putin into the Ukraine conflict. Whatever happens in the war, China sees its deepening ties to Russia as a way to cultivate a counterweight to the United States. Your thoughts on that, Colonel? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, that, that's really no surprise at all. I mean, they've, they've been signaling that for a long time, that they want to form a counterbalance to the United States because they haven't liked the fact that we have been pushing back on Ukraine and been pushing back on the, the Taiwan issue, which is obviously their their number one issue. Uh, but what I think we can see is that, as, as uh, your other guest here just pointed out, that I think China has been really shocked at, at how much the world, not just the West, rallied around to, to push back economically and financially on, on uh, Russia for what they've done. And I think that they realized that they could also suffer something serious like that. And if they do, they're going to want Russia to be helping them. So I think that they're going to be a little coy about pushing too hard on that, because if they ever get into a situation, I think they're going to want a quid right. pro quo. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Craig, I don't want to shortchange you in our remaining 15 seconds. Put a capstone on the segment for us. What should we look forward from Russia and specifically their ties to Beijing? 
I think it's important to remember that the relationship between the two countries is really more symbolic than substantive. Already we're seeing indications in Beijing that they are exceptionally nervous about the being isolated internationally, about what they're seeing about the U.S. response and the ability to, to unify the rest of the world against Russia. I think we're going to see an uh, increasing shift in Chinese policy as it relates to Russia. They're not going to cut them loose. But it's definitely not going to be as tight as it was before. Yeah, I think that's probably correct. Craig Singleton and uh, Colonel Daniel Davis. Gentlemen, thank you for spending time with us tonight. We certainly appreciate your contribution to the show. Thanks for having me.